Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and horror. Today we will explore the history of Borka, a domain marked by a bloody past, full of intrigues and betrayals, and which was once part of the kingdom of Barovia, on the material plane. Are you ready? To fulfill a profane pact with Inahira, we continue to search for the location of the Amulet of Souls. We pose as historians and pay a fee to a local stapan to search the library at his mansion. The old mansion once belonged to a renowned architect from Burka, who disappeared after falling from grace. We wander through his library, practically untouched by its new owner. Among ancient volumes, we began to unravel Borka's treacherous and bloody past. Power of the Raven. The current domain of Borka is a kingdom founded by nine independent city-states at the former Borsha region also referred as the Borgia region in the ancient texts. The cities, controlled by families of merchants and bankers, participated in the founding of the Kingdom of Barovia in the remote past and achieved the status of nobility under the rule and leadership of the von Zarovich dynasty. In 168 of the Barovian calendar, records indicate the adoption of the faith in Andro, the sun god, as the official religion of Barovia sponsored by the Zarovich family. The religion was lost and forgotten over the next 400 years, and little is known about its dogmas and practices today, and the vast majority of its temple were converted to the faith of Ezra and the Morning Lord in the following century. In the year 314, a dangerous conflict broke out between the noble families of the Borka region. This Lisnia, Katsky and Petrovna vied for control of the silver mines of Mount Greece, and identified assassins killed the Dislisnia family matriarch, Isabella. A blood feud began, and the kingdom of Barovia was enveloped in a civil war, known as the War of the Silver Daggers. The conflict lasted two years, in which open confrontations, treacherous murders, and revenge soaked the soil with blood. Count Baro von Zarovich managed to pacify the conflict in 316 of the Barovian calendar, but this clash left the kingdom quite weakened and unprepared for the conflict that followed it. More than that, the Dislisnia family patriarch, Pidwick, harbored a strong resentment against the Zarovich, believing that the revenge for his mother's death had not been completed. The tension and resentment between the Dislisnia and Zarovich worsened and passed from father to son, Leo Dislisnia was born in the year 320 of the Barovian calendar, and inherited his father's hatred against the Zarovits. The Dislisnia's plans for revenge has to be postponed, however, as Barovia was invaded by the Turks in 320 of the Barovian calendar. They came from the east and launched a military campaign supported by fanatical religious devotion to a deity known as Zagas or Zafar. Led by Durokan the Unbeatable, the Turks quickly conquered Barovia. Contrary to previous barbaric invasions, the Turks conquered and settled in the conquered lands, spreading the culture and dogmas of their faith. The von Zarovich family was humiliated and had to flee to the west as refugees in the lands of Borka, the homeland of the Dislisnia family. The war devastated Barovia. But the armies of the Turks never crossed the Balinok Mountains to reach the Borka region. The Zarovits and other noble families of the ancient Barovia started a bloody conflict led by General Strad von Zarovich, Count Barov's eldest son. The young warrior began a campaign to regain his family lands and honor, and proved to be a brave, charismatic warrior and a military genius. This conflict served to increase the resentment between Borka and Barovia. The noble families of bankers and merchants of Borka were accused of not helping as they should in the war, and profited by lending money and selling supplies to the armies led by General Strad. An old saying of Barovia told that if your son spilled his blood for the war, he was from Barovia, 
but if your coffer is billet silver, you are from Borca. After 26 years of battle, the Turks achieved a great victory and murdered Count Barov and his wife, Queen Ravenia, King and Queen of Barovia, despite the coup. Surprisingly, General Strad von Zarovich managed to win a decisive battle against his enemies. In 347, after 27 years of hard battles, the Turks were finally defeated and Strad began to rebuild his kingdom. Assuming the title of Count Strad, the conqueror began his government and efforts to rebuild Barovia. Pidwilk de Zlizia died seeing the glory of his rival, but his son, Leo de Zlizia, now a young and ambitious nobleman, carried on his revenge against the Zerovites. Leo de Zlizia hired the service of the feared Balverzi assassins to try to murder Count Strad in 350 of the Barovian canon. However, the Count managed to escape and defeat the assassin, but never discovered the true mastermind of the murder attempt. In the year 351 of the Barovian calendar, tragedy would once more strike the heart of Barovia. All the nobility of Barovia was invited to the wedding festivities of Strad's younger brother, Sergei von Zarovich, with the beautiful Tatiana Fedorovna, a peasant from the village of Barovia. Leotis Lysnia decided to carry out a risk and treacherous coup, and together with some of his conspirators, he hid among his family entourage assassins carrying crossbows that infiltrated Castle Ravenloft to eliminate his enemy and political rivals during the wedding ceremony. Leotis Lysnia, fearing a possible failure of his plan, pretended that he was ill and was absent from Castle Ravenloft before the festivities began but left behind many family members to attend the party, to not attract any suspicion. An even more macabre tragedy occurred that night. Count Strad von Zarovich committed the murder of his brother Sergei to fulfill a macabre pact and become a vampire. The death of her beloved fiancé and the presence of the now monstrous Strad made the bride Tatiana commit suicide, jumping from the castle bench. When the Zlizny's assassins finally attacked Count Strad, their poisoned bolts and arrows did nothing to the dead body of the vampire, who in fury murdered almost all guests of this bloody wedding. That night, the mist rose, swallowing Barovia to the demi plane of dread. The unclear circumstances of the massacre of Castle Riveloft had a profound impact on the kingdom. Count Strad simulated his own death at the event to hide his vampiric nature, and assumed the identity of his brother Sturm von Zarovich, who was outside Barovia at the time of the tragedy. Sturm von Zarovich took the throne of Barovia and adopted the name Strad von Zarovich II, in honor of the hero and liberator of Barovia. The name of the Dislysnia family was dragged through the mud of history. Count Strad accused the Dislysnia family of the massacre carried out during the marriage, they were hunted across Barovia. Many nobles of the family had died at Castle Ravenloft, but Reinhold's wife, Leo Dislysnia's brother, managed to escape with their children from the castle. The few Dislysnia who were scattered around Barovia were now unable to cross the borders and return home, were now unable to cross the borders and escape from the domain, now surrounded by the mists, and had to hide their identity. Leo Dislysnia hid in the mountains and secret coordinated force to save members of his family. Having discovered the truth about Count Strad, he prepared for the day he would have to face the vampire Count. In 398, they finally clashed. Strad discovered that Leo was hiding in the mountains, in the monastery of the Silver Threads. It was all a trap, however, and after entering Leo de Zlizny's room, Strad found himself prevented from escape in a room protected by sacred symbols. Leo's plan could have worked, but Count Strad was helped by the monks who had previously been dominated by the Count Vampire. Sinister rumors say that in revenge, Strad turned his rival into a vampire, but imprisoned him in the walls of the monastery in the mountains, where he remains, maddened by bloodlust and confinement to this day. 
For years, the Disney family had survived in the shadows, hiding their identity and heritage, and creating a mutual support network. Even in the darkest moments, they kept alive the memories of their noble origin and their old resentments. When other domains began to be revealed by the mists, the family began its diaspora, spreading to countless kingdoms as skilled traders and masters of deceit, acting as spies, manipulators and assassins. Finally, away from Strahd's reach, they abandoned their masks and anonymity, and adopted once more their name and noble ancestry, returning to the name Tislisnia. In 620, more than 300 years after the birth of the infamous Leo Dislisnia, Lev Dislisnia was born, starring a family branch that would rival the treacherous ancestral patriarch in fame and power. Lev Dislisnia lived in Mordenshire and had two children who would drastically change the lands of the mists. Jakob Dislisnia, born in 641 of the Barovian Canada, and Camille Dislisnia, born in 662 of the Barovian Canada. When he was 25, Yakov suffered a seizure while riding, and after waking up from a feverish period, he woke up saying he was a messenger of a deity named Ezra. Still bedridden, he wrote the first book of Ezra. For many years, he tried to propagate the words of his new faith and religion, without much success. His sister, Camille, was a beautiful young woman, polite and kind at first sight, but given to outbreaks of jealousy and anger. She had her marriage arranged with a Barovian boyar, Siegfried Grimmie, who took residence in modern Shire. After three years of marriage, Camille discovered that her husband had an affair, and using traditional methods and ancient secrets from her family, she poisoned him. Left this Lisnia, fearing that the modern authorities would discover his doctor crime, dispatched the young woman in a carriage to live with distant relatives in the kingdom of Invidia. Her carriage never reached its destination, being enveloped by the mists. While all this was happening with the Dislisnia family, the region of Borca, ancestral lands, were also lost in the mists. The ancient records found in Borca revealed that the region, like Barovia, was surrounded by mists and isolated from the world when the tragedy of Castor Ravenloft occurred. Perhaps Borca's land were also lost in the dim plain of dread, awaiting the return of the Dark Lord Leodislisnia. But whether this story reflects the truth or yet another lie created by the Dark Powers, we will never know. In the old region of Borca, the mists separated them from the realm of Barovia and the ruling family of the Zerovis. Almost all nobles and rulers had attended to the tragic wedding at Castor Ravenloft and they never returned home. With their trade routes cut off, they lost their access to wealth and resources, and the region was on the verge of chaos. The Borizzi family, wealthy merchants who had always supported the Zarovits in the war against the Turks, took over the reins of the region government and managed to prevent Borca's prosperous lands from surrounding to chaos and destruction. Many of them had been appointed as temporary regents and proxies for the missing nobility before their disappearing, and they took advantage of these legal contracts to impose order and legitimize their position. For three centuries, they ruled the region on the brink of ruin, taking control of the once vast resources of a prosperous kingdom. In 684, Camille Boristi's chariot was carried by the mist to Borca and the region finally came out of their isolation, and the borders of the mist dissipated, revealing the ancient lands of Barovia to the east, and several other domains around them. Finally free from its mystic confinement, the people of Borca believed that they had finally been released from the curse, when the noble family Dislisnia returned to their homeland. Camille Dislisnia's arrival in Borca shook the established power structure of the region. Despite acting as regents for 300 years during the power vacancy, the Borizzi family were not the legitimate heir to these lands, and soon the kingdom's merchants and bankers came to meet Camille, the money proof of her noble lineage. Camille agreed to prove her heritage 
but realizing that one of the regents was plotting to falsify her evidence, she prepared a cruel gift for him. The regent's family received a vast basket of fruit at home, and his whole family feasted on this generous gift, only to die with a dose of a slow and lethal poison. After the evidence of her noble ancestry was confirmed, Camille de Slesian became the absolute ruler of Borca, and summoned to her kingdom, just unveiled by the mists, her relatives in exile. Soon, the Dislinia, long isolated and scattered throughout the land of the mists, returned to Borca, bringing wealth, trade, power and influence. Camille proved to be a competent ruler and surrounded herself with counselors and family members. One of the members of the court was Jakob de Slesnia, her older brother, who continued his solitary preaching of the revelations of his faith in the goddess Ezra. Jakob sincerely sought to convert his sister to his faith and wanted to spread his vision across Borca, who had long abandoned and forgotten the faith in Andro. Camille saw his brother's religious delusions a tool for controlling the population and agreed to spread Ezra's faith throughout the kingdom, sponsoring the construction of the Great Cathedral, a project that would take more than 50 years to complete. Despite being the absolute ruler of her lands, Camille's fickle temperament made her an unpopular ruler. Always uncovering some new betrayal and coup against her government, she became paranoid. Yakov, on the other hand, found the Borka peasants eager for his revelations, and Ezra's fate expanded rapidly. Camille came to envy the growing popularity of Yakov, who had gradually come to be seen as a holy man. Although Camille, since childhood, had despised her romantic notions, she has always shown a violent, jealous and possessive temperament towards her many husbands. Throughout her life, she would marry three more times. Camille's second marriage was to Klaus Borizzi in 688 of the Barovian calendar. A member of the family who had controlled the region during the period of isolation in the mists. The marriage lasted a few years and the couple had three children. When she found out that Klaus had cheated on her with a servant, she became close to the maid and gave her scents and oils as a gift, knowing that she would use them on a date with her husband. The adulterous couple spent the night together while using these perfumed oils and both were victims of a fatal poison that melted their skin together in the year 697 of the Barovian calendar. That same year, Camille entered the third marriage with Stepan Taroyan, but soon discovered that he too had an affair with a mistress. Stepan managed to escape Camille's revenge and flee from Borca with his lover. In 698, Camille tried to cure her frustrations with a new marriage with Oled Fortich. Oled, however, tried to assassinate Camille shortly after the wedding, but the astute ruler managed to avoid the attack and cornered Oled. Her murderous husband begged for his life and confessed that he was just a pawn in a wide conspiracy of her entire family who intended to replace her and take power in Borca. Although we may never know whether Ole was telling the truth about this conspiracy, or seeking only a scapegoat to survive, Camille showed no forgiveness and poisoned Ole. Then, fearing that her entire family was conspiring against her, she poisoned everyone who attended to her husband's funeral. This macabre act by Camille decimated many members of the Dislinia lineage, among them her elder brother Yaakov, who at the time was elected as the first Praetorius of the Church of Ezra, the highest authority of this new faith. Perhaps the only member of her family who was truly loyal to Camille during her reign, he was murdered due to her paranoia and madness. She lost her brother and ally, and Yaakov's death caused great popular commotion, and many accused Camille directly as the murder of the religious leader. Advised by her counselors to alleviate the situation under pain of facing a popular revolt, Camilla tried to disassociate herself from her brother's death, making generous donations to the Church of Ezra and ordering the construction of a statue of Yaakov in the country art of the Great Cathedral, 
Behind the scenes, however, these gifts came linked to threats to the high members of the church to calm the spirits of the population. These internal pressures, bribes and threats from Camille, as well as the exploitation of the late Yaakov's image, caused a crack in the church, with part of its members disengaging the sect and moving to the lands of Mordant. After these failed attempts at marriage and the alleged betrayal of her entire family, Camille had returned to use her surname Borizzi from her second marriage. Although beautiful and powerful, she rejected future marriage proposals and political alliances. Camille developed deep hatred and resentment toward men, and saw betrayals everywhere. The political instability of the kingdom and the arbitrary demands of its ruler probably would have led to a more serious revolt. However, with the turn of the century in 700 of the Barovian Canada, Falkovnia initiated the Dead Man Campaign, making a military invasion on Darkon. The Bedicos conquering posture of his neighboring kingdom made the nobles, aristocrats and peasants of Borca found a common enemy to fear. Darkon's invasion was thwarted by undead who rose at King Azal in command and Borca began to fear that Vlad Rakov would turn his eyes to Borca's rich and ill-defended kingdom. While Borca reinforced his old-fashioned walls and defense, Camille activated his family well-known network of merchants and spies. In the year 706 of the Barovian calendar, Falkovnia sent a military detachment against Borca, hoping to find little resistance, but his soldiers suffered an horrendous death under the influence of a powerful poison. Camille's spy network had discovered Drakov's invasion plans beforehand and had poisoned his army provisions in the event that became known as the Widow Massacre. Vlad Drakov learned a hard lesson from underestimating Lady Camille, but the shadow of a new Falkovnian invasion hanged in the air. During the next decade, Borca lived between the fear of war and of the unstable and cruel temperament of their ruler, Camille. Borca's unsatisfied elite attempted several coups against their ruler, but was unsuccessful in their murderous attempts. Ivana Borizzi, Camille's eldest daughter, grew up in this unstable environment. Ivana was as beautiful as her mother in her youth, and was seen by society as someone innocent and easy manipulated. Camille tried to instill in her doctor contempt and hatred for men, but it is known that during her teenage, Ivana was involved in a romance that ended in tragedy, with her lover dying in suspicious circumstances. Ivana's desolation brought her closer to her mother, and she learned from her the secrets of herbology and alchemy, known only to the Dislinsians. Perhaps Camille did not see the monster she helped to create, and when her body was found dead, by one of her powerful poisons, many suspected that the innocent and beautiful Ivana had done it against her mother. With Camille's death, Ivana inherited her lands and titles, and was able to calm the interests of Borca's treacherous elite. Ivana delegated power and responsibilities to the Estepans, serving the interests of the elite and getting rid of the administrative responsibilities of her government. Borca's wealthy merchants and bankers were happy to ascend to nobility, and Ivana raised fees and taxes to pay for her exuberant lifestyle and the growing and parasitic aristocracy. Ivana's rise to power was accompanied a few years later by the unveiling of the mists of a new part of the ancestral lands of Borca, the mountainous region that would come to be known as Dorvinia. This region once part of the ancient realm of Barovia in the material plane, had in its border the controversial Mount Greece and its disputed silver mines, and was unveiled by the mists when Ivan Dislisnia, Ivana's cousin, fled into the misty frontier while fleeing from his own family. Ivan was born on the same day as Ivana in 689 of the Barovian Canada and many claim that the young man inherited the madness from his aunt Camille. He and Ivana were very close as children. But since their childhood, strange deaths surrounded Ivan, and the young man had an unhealthy obsession with his older sister Christina. 
In 709 of the Barovian calendar, Ivan poisoned Christina and her husband, and for the murder he was chased by his family to the misty frontier. Ivan emerged in the mountainous lands of the ancient Borsha region, and just like his aunt Camille, found a land that had been isolated for centuries in the mists, by regions controlling the lands of the former nobility. Ivan wasted no time and used his cunning and brutality to take control of those lands. He named the realm Dorvinia, in honor of a distant ancestor. Dorvinia was a land full of vast mineral resources, and Ivan ruled as a cruel tyrant, demanding absolute bribes and playing dangerous and little games of intrigue amongst his supporters. Dorvinia emerged as an opportunity for wealth and social ascension, and ended up attracting to Ivan's court the most greedy and cruel members of Borka aristocracy. Dorvinia's emergence from the mists also attracted Falkovnia's attention. Rumor has it that the cruel and audacious Ivan intended to ally himself with Falkovnia, and strike a deal to supply the Falkovnian armies with iron weapons and gunpowder. Drakov, however, believed that he could conquer such wealth and resources by force. In 727, Drakov ordered an unexpected and unpredictable attack to Dovinia, that escaped the attention of Ivan's spies. In this brutal assault, the soldiers of Falkovnia reached the city of Lichburg, where they massacred the population. The Falkovnian invasion left a trail of death, but the Golden Claw Massacre also ended in the death of all Falkovnian forces. Before they began to plunder the Dorvinia's riches, the soldiers began to vomit blood and died of poisoning, from a venom so potent that everyone who touched their bodies was also contaminated, and their bodies had to be incinerated. Lord Ivan boasts that he disguised himself in a Falkovnian armor, and spread a powerful poison among his enemies, while they massacred the population of Lichburg. These Falkovian attacks prompted the signing of the Treaty of the Four Towers, an alliance of mutual defense against Falkovnia that involved the realms of the Molly, Mordant, Richmulor, Borka, and Orvinia. The name of the Four Towers comes not from the number of nations involved, but from the signatory families, Gigno, Wadamey, Rhaenyra, and Dislysnia. The Dark Twins, as Ivana and Ivan became known, were close friends during their childhood, and always kept Borka and Dovinia as allied nations, commercial and political partners. When the Grand Conjunction took place in 740 of the Barovian calendar, both kingdoms were shaken by tremors and supernatural forces, and Ivan and Ivana dropped the isolation of their respective courts to run to each other in search of mutual support. When the tremors stopped, Ivan and Ivana had weeks of intense negotiations, and after intrigues, bribes and threats among members of their courts, they signed a treaty for the unification of their kingdoms, and both were unified as the current nation of Borka. A new balance of power and alliance had been struck between the Dark Twins. Ivan de Slesia took control of the military forces and organized the Estepa militia into a Borkan army. Many suspect that he also commands a dangerous network of spy and assassins who directly interfere in the policy of neighboring kingdoms. Ivana, in turn, maintained a life of luxuries and excesses, but strengthened her control over the indentured system, managing taxes, commercial and diplomatic agreements that ensure a constant flow of wealth to her coffers, coming from outside and within the realm. As time passes, the relationship between the two cousins has deteriorated, while a constant struggle for power is raged in the shadows. Ivan is now an aged and resentful man, but still very astute, dangerous and cruel. Ivana's eternal beauty and youth seems to cause him great envy and despair. The elders in Borka claimed that the realm now suffered from the excesses of two Camilles, with Ivan being the heir of her madness and brutality, and Ivana the heir to her misanthropy and contempt for humanity. Our research of the history of Borka reveals a past of betrayals and disturbing crimes, but we found no clue about the Amulet of Souls. 
when he had almost given up on our research. A strange book in the library draws our attention. As we pulled the book out, we discovered a secret room, and behind it, the notes of the former owner of the mansion, a famous architect who disappeared under mysterious circumstances. We carefully explored this chamber and discovered envelopes containing piles of secrets. Using secret passages and tunnels implanted in his building projects, he had spied on his rivals and used the accumulated secrets to blackmail and obtain political gains. Join us, subscribe to this channel, and together we will read the content of these incriminating letters and unveil Boca's dark and bloody secrets.